Welcome everyone, I'm GM Josh Fidel. And uh, today I'd like to cover the topic of middle game awareness. Uh, so this is actually a, a video that I mostly is targeted kind of towards beginners at chess. Um, and it's not something I've done as much of. Uh, most of the videos that I've posted on my YouTube channel have been really you know, for intermediate to advanced players. Uh, and I like doing that kind of thing. I still intend to do that. But uh, very recently on uh, Chessable, and I put a I'll put a link in the description to the video, uh, I posted a video on common middle game, uh, sorry, common opening mistakes uh, in, for beginners. And right now I'm currently working on a middle game course. So I'm seeing lots of kind of going through lots of begin uh, beginner games. And we're talking beginners like people who, you know, know how to move the pieces and know some basic strategies and tactics, but that's about it uh, and aren't that experienced yet. So I kind of see, you know, where they go wrong quite a bit. Uh, and I also have some, a couple students who are also big, uh, about in that range. Uh, mostly I teach people who are a bit more advanced, but at the same time, it is something I see. So I see a lot of patterns and I wanted to share... Some of the things I noticed uh, in these YouTube videos is kind of like a preview to my middle game course in a, in a sense. Uh, and I, I'm sharing things that are not necessarily in the course, but that uh, I've just picked up and, and wanted to show. And one of those major areas that I find that beginners struggle, especially in a middle game where the pieces are kind of all over the place, is awareness. Just where are things, where are the pieces, what's being attacked. And it can get overwhelming. In an opening, sometimes there aren't that many pieces out. So at least at first, you kind of know what you're doing and you know where things are. But in a middle game, things can become hectic really quickly. So what I wanted to give you guys was some techniques as far as like, how do I sort out this mess of a position and figure it out and be able to, you know, discern what moves are safe. What is my opponent threatening? What am I threatening? and thus be able to avoid blunders and make better decisions. So there, uh, awareness is actually going to be the first chapter of the course I'm working on, but I want to show you some other examples and how you can apply awareness to your own games right now. So let's take this position. This was, again, taken from a uh, beginner game that I, I had in my database here. And it's kind of a mess, right? Like white has a queen and two knights out. Uh, black has this queen that stole a rook on h1 and is now buried on g1. And you see things like this, and this is okay. You know, this is what you'll notice when, you know, you watch games of grandmaster players, but even just masters or expert players or even intermediate players, right? You, you don't see this kind of thing quite as often where pieces are just scattered all over the place. But when you're new to chess, this is just part of the deal, right? Um, one thing I would mention is that you usually want to get out all your pieces. And what you'll notice in beginner games is that there are often not a lot of pieces out. Uh, whereas when you see master games and grandmaster games, you'll see that everyone's kind of developing all their pieces usually. So there are exceptions to this. Uh, and we'll even show, I'll even show you at the end an example where uh, a couple GMs made some pretty bad errors. But, you know, for the most part, that's like a pattern you'll see. Whereas as you can see, this queen is kind of hemmed in on G1. Uh, the white pieces are very, very active. Uh, and here I just want to show you. So part of the deal is knowing what is attacked at all times is like a very important start to the position. And you want to know for all the pieces. So for example, if you're white, what are you attacking? Well, you're attacking this knight on g8 with the knight. You're attacking this pawn. You're attacking this pawn, right? You can see how this knight is attacking those things. That's it. The queen, what is it attacking? This pawn, this pawn, and this pawn, this bishop. It's not quite a pawn. Uh, and I believe that's mostly it. Now, what is black attacking? The queen is the most obvious piece. It's attacking all these guys. The bishop is attacking this. Now, does that mean that all these moves are valid? Of course not. Uh, the reason for that is because some things are defended, right? The pawn on d7 is defended by the... Oops, sorry. Uh, so if we look, and let's kill some of these here so the board doesn't get too confused. Uh, I do not intend to confuse you that much with arrows. However, 
you'll see that this pawn on d7 is defended by the knight, bishop, and king, which means that it's not really in danger. It's not something that black's going to worry about too much. The bishop is guarded by the pawn, which means you're not really going to want to take it with the queen. Uh, and this pawn is the one thing that's kind of not guarded, so this is like a very tempting move. The other thing that I would say you could take, this knight is capturable and looks quite nice. But as you'll notice, the rook can capture and return. So that would just be a trade, trading a knight for a knight. So once again, it doesn't mean that that's the end. It doesn't mean that, oh, trading a knight for the knight isn't a great move. It might be a perfectly good move. But it's one of those things that you want to be aware of. Again, this is just increasing like what's attacked and what isn't. Um, and there's other factors as well, which we can get into. Um, but we also can maybe grab this pawn. It's not overly exciting to grab this pawn, maybe, but it's definitely a threat because even though the rook can take the knight, it's defended once. Our queen also attacks the h7 pawn once. And usually one attacker, one defender means we're able to take it. Uh, notice how the knight, the rook is worth a bit less, a bit more, sorry, than the knight. So capturing is good. So again, this is a mess of a position, but you can sort of sort it out slowly by determining what you're able to attack. So even though it's kind of crazy, queen takes pawn is maybe the only real huge threat white has. But of course, you'd be remiss if you just did your, your own threats, right? What is my opponent threatening? The fact is that you're actually defending yourself quite well. Taking this f1 bishop looks great, but the king defends it. Uh, people often forget about the king as a defender, but it's often a very important one. This bishop can come in and take, but we have, again, knight, queen, and king defending the pawn. And you'll also notice that this knight on g4 is a really great piece because it also defends this, the f6 knight, and the f2 pawn. Pretty nice piece, right? So we have all these things defended, and of course this pawn is very well defended because you're defending it with both pawns. So the queen, the reason why I think it's hemmed in a bit on g1 is because you're not able to really escape so easily because you can't take any of those things. So, again, a lot of this is about just being aware of what's happening. One thing you'll notice is that often taking pawns is not such a big deal. Like, especially in a game this crazy with lots going on, you're not going to win too many games because you won an extra pawn for a while. Like, if, if, you, if you're winning games just because you win a pawn, that means you're probably a more advanced player at that point. Um, but one thing I would definitely say is that you want to be very aware of what's attacked no matter what it is. And a lot of that is just going bit by bit. Uh, so I'm doing it very slowly now. I'm going to have you guys, you know, have you figure out some of the things about the position as well. And, but this is like slow and painstaking, but it's one of those things that you get in the habit of doing. And eventually your brain actually does it automatically. When I look at this position, I'm not looking necessarily individually at each capture because my brain's already going, okay, your knight defends these two pawns, everything else is defended. Largely because I've just seen enough chess positions in my lifetime that it becomes very simple. Uh, now that doesn't mean I won't miss things uh, and we'll actually get into that a bit. Uh, but doing these checks of just what is attacked, what is not attacked, what can I do? What are the checks? What are the captures? Is just always important. And you want to get in the habit of just kind of browsing all the time. And the next part of awareness is asking, what does my opponent's move do? What, how did the position change from my opponent's move? So in this position, it's Black's move. And in the game, they played the move d6. This doesn't appear to attack anything because the pawn on d6 you know, just defends the bishop defends e5 but if you look carefully you'll see that it actually unleashes this bishop on c8 onto the queen so this is the kind of subtle attacking move that people often mis like don't don't pay attention to in beginning games but one way you can always kind of bypass this is to ask yourself the question what did my opponent's last move do what did my last like not just the move itself like the pawn on d6 what does it do but did they develop any other pieces? Did they make any other threats? And then it's almost like in your brain, the bishop takes f5 move just like is a red flash going off. Like this is just something that is something I have to worry about. And in the game, white just didn't notice it. They took this h7 pawn, which is safe. After rook takes h7, there is queen takes. It looks like a nice move because the queen's going to come into f8 with check. That looks really nice. But unfortunately, black just captured the queen and white felt very, very bad. So once again, this is the kind of blunder that happens all the time. It's not 
a huge deal. It's not like, oh my goodness, you know, this player's never going to get better. I mean, this it's par for the course, kind of. But it's one of those things where a lot of your games will be decided by blunders like this until you learn to kind of be able to sort positions like this out. And the way to do that is you ask yourself very individually, what is attacked and what is not attacked? So a lot of that means, you know, with undeveloped pieces, one of the reasons why having undeveloped pieces isn't great uh, is that, like, notice how the rook on a1, bishop on c1, the rook on a8, knight on b8, they don't really attack anything because they're not out, right? So that's the importance of getting your pieces out. Notice the bishop on c8 does attack something, so you have to be a bit careful. Uh, and again, it's why it's a bit of a sneaky move. So it, probably white should play a move like queen takes g5. Uh, so now you're threatening the discovery. Knight takes g8 with check. Notice how it unleashes the queen on the king. And this f2 pawn is still very, very nicely guarded by this wonderful knight on g4. So let's move to another example, and I'm actually going to have you figure out what you would do in each situation. So to move to the next example, we have this position. And I saw this was reached um, in a beginner game. And white has kind of a choice. Black just played e6 to e5, so a normal central pawn break. So white can either capture this pawn, or they can capture the h7 pawn with check with the bishop is another, is another option. So uh, there are obviously other moves besides those two. But one of the things I do in my course and I really like is that the, on a chessboard, there are so many options. It's really hard to navigate. It's hard to figure out everything. So in order to figure, like, learn certain patterns and learn how not to blunder in certain ways, it's helpful to have an option. So pawn takes pawn, very logical move. Bishop takes h7 check. If we can get away with that, that's great. So which one would you play? If you want to pause the video, go right ahead and try to determine which one you would you would go for. So once again, it's one of those things where if you see it, it's kind of obvious to you. You're probably going, all right, Josh, like why, <laughs> why are you doing this? But the fact is that sometimes people overlook certain things. So at the moment, bishop takes h7 check. If black had to play king h8, this would be an excellent move. But once again, awareness is the key. Notice how the knight covers this h7 square which is really important. So now knight takes h7, you can take with the knight, but as mentioned, the king serves as a perfectly fine defender. Black can take this. Black could also think about capturing the bishop, but then you have to give up your rook to the knight, which isn't as good. So king takes h7 and black has won a piece for a pawn, right? Because you captured a pawn and a knight and I've captured a knight and a bishop. This is another skill you wanna develop, being able to determine after a sequence who's lost which material, right? But notice how, again, there are two defenders and there's only two attackers and you need more attackers than defenders typically to safely capture something. So that means that, of course, pawn takes pawn is a much better move. Notice how you only have two attackers on e5 and black has the queen, bishop and knight to defend. But it's only a pawn trade, right? You take with a pawn, they recapture your pawn, probably with the knight. And now they're attacking your bishop, so you probably move your bishop, and life kind of goes on. You know, it's a normal position, nothing tragic has happened. The one note I would make is that this knight on g5, white probably played knight f3 to g5 earlier. And, I mean, I'm sure they did. Uh, but it's often not a great move unless you can do something. Notice how the knight would rather kind of be back on f3 than on g5. So this is kind of where the adage, especially earlier in the opening, you want to get out all your pieces, is a very important thing, and not move a piece twice. Uh, is a common opening thing. And I know this is the middle game because this is a little bit past, but just as a, a side note, that moves like knight g5, you usually don't want to play unless they serve a very direct purpose. Like you're going to threaten h7. If you're not threatening h7, this knight on g5 is actually not that great. So just something to kind of keep in mind. But the more important thing is to make sure you don't get tempted by this h7 pawn. Uh, again, it's one of those things, once you see it, it looks obvious, but when you're playing a game, if you're not paying attention to everything that's attacked and what's defended and what isn't, it's an easy way to end up losing material and often the game. So let's move to another one. So this position I actually want to look at from Black's point of view. So our position is is kind of lousy. <laughs> we're, we're down two, two minor pieces. We're down a knight and a bishop. Notice we only have a knight and bishop, and they have knight, bishop, knight, bishop. That's not great. Uh, so we're already not super happy, but we have pressure on d4. The king is weak. And one of the wonderful things uh, about being a beginner and playing other beginners is that you're not out of the game nearly as easily 
Uh, I can tell you that like when I'm playing another Grandmaster, for example, if one of us blunders like a pawn or weakens a square horribly, it could mean suffering the rest of the game. It could mean you don't get back in it. Um, and it's a very sad thing, right? But the cool thing when you're playing as a beginner and even a novice and intermediate player sometimes is that you can make horrible mistakes and you're still totally in the game. Um, and it's, it's actually a nice thing because it means that you have leeway as you're learning to navigate these kind of crazy, muddy positions. Uh, it gives you leeway. It gives you a chance to get back in it. And, and it's a really great thing. So it's something you want to keep in mind. So to that end, we're not necessarily trying to win as black here. We're just trying to stay in the game. So in the game, white played the move queen a4. But I'm curious, after queen c2, what would you play here as black? So once again, take that moment, stop pause and try to figure out everything that's attacked, everything we're attacking, and which option you think would be a great option. So again, if you'd like to pause, go for it. Um, and keep in mind what is attacked and make sure you're very thorough. So if you're done, here is what I would say about that. So we're attacking this bishop on e2, but it's not too relevant because white has two defenders. We're pinning it, meaning it can't move due to the king, which I like. Uh, this pawn we're attacking, but again, the knight defends it. It's not super useful. So the main thing that looks great is we can take this d4 pawn with either the queen or the knight. The knight would be most tempting for me, largely because we are able to then attack the queen, attack the bishop, attack the pawn. It looks great, right? It looks great until you see white has queen takes h7 and that is mate. The bishop covers our escape square, so we can't run. And the rook defends the queen, which means we can't capture it. So this would actually just be the end of the game right away. We do not get to fight. We do not get any chances. Really sad, right? But I would say that that's how chess is much of the time. It's an unforgiving game. Uh, and even no matter what your level is, if you make a horrible blunder, you can just lose right away. And... It's one of the reasons why having this awareness and building it in every position is so important. Uh, there are a lot of subtle points to chess, a lot of uh, stuff that I find like really fun to learn and play and stuff like that. But until you have basics down, until you make sure that you're really locking down those blunders and attacks, you're going to find it very hard to progress to those more subtle things because your games will be decided by checkmates and by... Um, you know, tactics and things of that nature. Uh, so the best way that black can play here is most likely the move h6. Or a similar move, or g6. So you at least get out of the main. And the good news for us is that next move maybe we'll play knight takes d4. So we have it kind of on deck. We're down too much material to really be in the game quite yet. But if white makes a mistake or two, we're right back in it. Whenever your opponent has a weak king, you never know. Uh, in the game after queen a4, this actually also sets kind of a trick because we can take on d4 with the queen, but trading queens when we're down tons of material isn't really wonderful. Um, we could play something kind of, there are a bunch of tricky moves, but the basic thing is that we'd love to play knight takes d4, but once again, awareness dictates that <laughs> we actually just lose right away. So this is another thing. What piece... Like, this is a hard thing because white is not attacking the e8 rook yet. And that's what makes this hard. But this is a pin on the knight, meaning the knight cannot really move safely. And it's something you also want to be aware of. So you don't just ask, what is my opponent attacking? You ask, well, what can move and what cannot? The knight cannot really move because giving up e8 with check or mate, um, it will be mate actually, no matter where the knight moves, is way too strong, right? However, if we play a move, we could even play something fun like bishop takes g4. I know giving away another piece doesn't seem very wonderful, but now we can take because our rook guards our rook. So this would actually be kind of a fun try. I might try this. Again, when you're down a lot of material, go nuts, right? Like, you know, you're not going to make things too much worse. Uh, but after a move like queen c2, you want the ability to spot the mate to be to be careful it's not that it's we're dropping a pawn necessarily that's the problem it's the fact that queen takes pawn is mate if they had to take with the rook we would be totally fine taking on d4 but they're threatening mate and this is something you always want to be aware of so this kind of awareness is really going to help you so next i actually want to show you a position 
from a Grandmaster game. This position was played very recently in the um, Chessable Championships. I forget the whole name of the event. That's on me. But basically, this was played between white was Jan Pomnishi and black was Ali Reza Firuja, two of the strongest GMs in the whole world. Uh, very recently, uh, Nepomnishi challenged for the world championship title against Magnus Carlsen and then against Ding Loren. Uh, so we're talking really strong players. But the cool th thing about all these rules and these things like adding awareness is no matter how strong you are, if you are not aware, you're going to make mistakes. So for some context, this was like a playoff game and it was rapid and these players are probably very, very nervous. They're playing for a lot. Not that they're not used to it, but, you know, even like incredible players become a lot more human when there's a lot on the line and there's not a lot of time. So in this position, actually, something uh, quite funny happened. So, you know, the normal move, this is a kind of standard E45 position. Uh, White could play a move like A4. Uh, and actually, I would ask what the move A4 does. Wow. Well, there you know. You know what A4 does. That's a little hint. But now I'm going to ask you, what's wrong with the move White played, which is rookie one? So notice how... Like, what exactly is wrong with this move? It doesn't look like, again, players of this level very rarely just give away a piece by hanging it. It happens. Uh, we, I've done it. We've all done it. Even players incredibly strong have done it. But it's usually not something quite that simple. The question is, what does rookie one do that's a bit wrong? And the key is that it loosens a pawn so this is another thing you can do with awareness right like what pieces are vulnerable what what pieces are not defended and this is another a way you can even boost your awareness to the next level so it's funny because this is something i have no doubt if either of these players was given this as a position black to move they would solve it in probably a second but when you're playing the game it's easy to just get into a mode of playing moves and it's so important not to do this no matter how simple the position seems, take that moment. Because here, black has actually several good continuations. Again, if you want to pause and try to figure out the ideas in its entirety, go ahead. Uh, but the basic gist is that because white has this loose bishop on b5, and this pawn on f2 is now looser because the rook is no longer defending it, notice how here the rook on f1 guards f2, so it's not as much of a weakness. So, But white played rook e1. And the real key as well is that the the f2 pawn is not like it's not hanging, right? It's defended by the king. It's not like the pawn is just hanging. But sometimes when you have too many pieces and pawns that are a little bit vulnerable, it can actually cause problems in your position. So this actually leads a bit to the tactics chapter uh, that I'm gonna have. Like is one of the other chapters that it will have. But it kind of, it, it's tied into awareness because being aware of what can be attacked and what is vulnerable is a super important part of any position. So in this position, like what would you do as black? Um, so there are actually several very, very nice options. One option which actually looks very natural to me would be knight g4. So you're attacking this pawn. So probably in the game, the Pomnishi thought that he could simply play a move like rookie 2 And then... But here, knight takes f2, I think, is very strong. The idea being that I'm threatening to move away with check and stuff. And if you try to capture the knight... Now, normally, giving up a knight and bishop is what we gave up for a rook and pawn is not a good trade for us. But the bishop on b5 is vulnerable. The king on f2 is vulnerable. And you notice we want to look for what is a way to take advantage of these pieces. So how can we take advantage of these pieces, right? And the way we do it is with a very nice check. We have queen c5 check. Notice without this move, we should not take on f2 at all. Everything is dependent on this. But the idea is that now we're attacking the bishop and the king. And this is uh, very bad news because white will have to move their king probably. Uh, they could block with the knight, but that doesn't really help. Uh, we could take it with the pawn or even the knight actually. And after the king moves, for example, say, I don't know, f1, we can actually take the bishop. Believe it or not, it's still check. Um, but either way, we're up uh, a rook for a, a knight here and a pawn. 
we have actually a rook and pawn for a knight, so we're up a healthy amount of material. So this would be very nice. They could try taking here, uh, and then this is actually very important. Because we don't want to allow rook takes knight, we should actually withdraw our knight first, something like knight check. And then, for example, if they play king h1, now we take. And once again, we've stolen that f2 pawn. We have a great position. But if you chose, wanted to be simpler about this, you could also just take on f2 immediately and play this move, queen c5 check. Forking the king and bishop. You're only winning a pawn, but look at white's king. Look at how open it is. Look at how exposed it is. You're winning a pawn and you're getting a great position, which usually means that something's gone horribly wrong. Uh, and it's actually kind of neat because after king f1, for example, you could take the bishop, but it's actually maybe even more interesting to play here first, threatening mate, and then take the bishop next move. Uh, and then maybe you'll take the bishop with check, play f5 even, try to attack the king, who knows. Uh, this part's less important. But the reason I'm showing it to you is because in the game, black played h6. And then you'd think that now white would go, oh no, my f2 pawn. But they actually played h3. So they're stopping knight g4, but they're not stopping bishop takes f2. Uh, and finally, black played knight b8, and then a4. The bishop's defended. Everything's okay. So the game ended up in a draw. Like, both sides missed this for several moves. This is not a typical thing uh, of players of this level. Um, but I find that in, like, beginner games or even in intermediate games, this kind of thing can happen quite a bit. But the key here is to be extremely aware of what pieces are vulnerable, which pieces are not defended that many times or not defended enough. Uh, a lot of mistakes are just based on, oh, I'm hanging the F2 pawn because there are too many attackers. This is like the next level of mistake that is much more common in more advanced players, which is that, yes, the F2 pawn is defended, but I have just too many loose pieces and they can be taken advantage of in a more tactical fashion. So it's the kind of thing that you want to be super aware of. Uh, in any case, I, I hope that this um, you know, this video kind of made sense and made it so gives you an idea of what to look for. So just to recap, you want to look for pieces that are attacked. Number one, that by attacked by me, attacked by my opponent. You want to be aware of all your checks. Uh, so you want to know everything that's every every check you have because sometimes checks are really really important moves as you're seeing because they're extremely forcing. Um, and to also just be aware of like what's what's maybe vulnerable, what's maybe defended for the moment but is not defended by that like, but could be attacked again and maybe isn't defended that well. Um, and just being aware of what is weak and what is not is a big part of not just like blunder not blundering but it's a big part of taking advantage of weak squares or errors and it can kind of translate into all parts of the game so trying to build this awareness is something that will make you a much more advanced chess player um if you liked this video and this kind of thing uh, definitely check out my chessable course for uh the opening phase where i focus just on that and avoiding mistakes where i give choices between two moves um and uh i'll definitely plan on putting uh, more content out like this so let me know what you think and uh take it easy